Hello and welcome to the webinar. Today's topic is organic management of striped cucumber beetle on organic farms. This is your host, Alice Formiga of the eOrganic Community of Practice at eExtension.org. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website at extension.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This webinar will also be recorded and archived, and we've also uploaded a handout of the slides of the webinar, which you can find in the handout section of your control panel. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for your questions. We'll be reading as many questions as we can after the presentation is over. So for today's presentation, I'd like to welcome our three presenters, Abby Seaman, Jeffrey Gardner, and Lauren Brzezowski. Abby Seaman is the Vegetable Integrated Pest Management Coordinator at the New York State IPM program at the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station in Geneva, New York. Jeffrey Gardner is a research entomologist at Cornell University, and Lauren Brzezowski is a graduate student in the lab of Michael Mazurek, also at Cornell University. They're all members of the NIFA OREI funded Eastern Sustainable Cucurbit Project, which is a collaboration of growers, researchers, and extension agents working to find solutions for the many challenges facing organic cucurbit producers. In the last few months, we ran two other webinars from this project, one about cucurbit viruses and one about cucurbit downy mildew, and you can find those in our archive. So with that, I'm going to turn the screen control over to our first presenter, Abby Seaman. Well, hello everybody out there in webinar land. Um, we are going to spend 45 minutes talking about different aspects of uh, striped cucumber beetle management in organic production. And I'd hope it, this doesn't cause a huge mass defection, but we will not end up with the silver bullet for a striped cucumber beetle production. Well, we will end up going through um, some different approaches that farmers can take and kind of put together a system on their own farm. But I have to say that there's, there's some more work that we need to do to be able to say that we can be uh, guaranteed success with striped cucumber beetle management. It's one of the most challenging pests um, in the Northeast with growers that I work with across um, all the different vegetable crops that we work with. So with that warning um, caveat, I'll get started. Um, anybody who uh, grows cucurbits, I think, will be familiar with uh, the, stri the striped cucumber beetle. Uh, it's a small yellow and black striped beetle um, with a black underside. This is just a photograph of it here. So I just wanted to cover the uh, striped cucumber beetle life cycle. So we start at the very basics here. Um, this beetle overwinters as an adult um, in field borders. And then um, so in the spring, they migrate to the fields and uh, to cucurbit fields, and then they feed on the foliage of newly emerging uh, direct seeded fields or, or transplants. Um, and then the adults, they lay their eggs at the base of the plants and the larvae feed on the roots. Uh, we don't typically think of the larval root feeding as uh, causing economic damage, uh, but that uh, I, I'm, I can't say that that is, is always the case. Um, after the, those, those eggs from that overwintering generation uh, develop on the roots as, as larvae, and that uh, uh, another uh, set of, of adults emerge in late July to early August. And again, uh, we work in the Northeast, so I'm kind of talking about it from a Northeast perspective. It may be different um, in different parts of the country. And so those summer adults uh, can cause damage by feeding on, on developing fruit, or uh, especially they can scar things like pumpkins and uh, winter squash. Making um, making them less marketable. So that summer adults, uh, those summer adults are the ones that act, that uh, overwinter and and then emerge the following season. And so so this is the kind of damage that we see from striped cucumber beetle. Uh, they do tend to, uh, they can sometimes accumulate on the edges of the fields. So and and get some really high populations built up on individual plants. And, and cause a lot of direct damage. So this is direct, the kind of direct damage that we would see on a from a direct on a direct seeded um, plant. Uh, 
and uh, this is the kind and this is the kind of damage that we can see on big on larger plants. So that they they consume a lot of foliage, um, and uh, they have the ability to call uh, other beetles in through an aggregation pheromone. So so individual plants can really be hammered by by these cucumber beetles. And on some farms, there's there are just really high persistent populations. Other farms uh, don't seem to have as much of a problem from year to year. And uh, the th what's behind that difference in populations on different farms is is not is kind of a mystery in many ways. We haven't. I, I, I don't have a good sense of, of why it's more of a problem on some farm than, farms than others. All right. So in addition to the direct damage that the striped cucumber beetles uh, do, in terms of uh, possible yield reduction from that, uh, they also transmit a, a disease called bacterial wilt. It, it's, it um, overwinters in the gut of the beetle. And then as they feed, especially as they feed in those heavy aggregations, they introduce the, the bacteria into the plant. So on the left, the top left photo here, you can see a cucumber beetle feeding damage. And then you can see a yellow halo around that area of feeding damage. And that's actually the bacteria kind of um, moving into the, into the tissue. And then eventually what happens is that bacteria becomes systemic. It clogs, clogs up the vascular tissue of, of the plant or the plumbing of the plant. And then you get wilting because the plant isn't able to transmit uh, water and nutrients throughout the plant anymore. So striped cucumber beetle is also implicated um, in, uh, as a transmitter of squash mo mosaic virus as well. And this is just a photo of what squash mosaic, one of the ty types of symptoms that you could see with squash mosaic virus. Okay, so um, just a few, uh, a little bit of information about the, the larva again. Like I said, I, we don't consider it to be an economically damaging pest for the direct feeding on, on the roots. So uh, again, this is what the larva looks like. It's uh, it, it, down in the soil feeding on the roots uh, for part of the season. Um, and so there's another type of uh, damage that the that the larvae can do to the uh, to the um, fruit, and it's called a rindworm damage. And there seems to be uh, a complex of different uh, insects that can cause this, but striped cucumber beetle larvae can be one of them. So where the um, uh, where the fruit touches the ground, it could it could possibly cause this type of damage to the fruit. And uh, this is some damage that I saw years ago. I don't, I don't, haven't seen this very much, but this was in a heavily mulched planting, and this was the kind of stem damage that striped cucumber beetle uh, larvae seem to be doing in that heavily mulched situation. So I'm going to talk a little bit. We're going to, we're going to talk about a few different ways to think about managing striped cucumber beetle. Um, we have not had very much luck finding uh, effective insecticides for controlling striped cucumber beetle. I'll show you a little bit of data later so that uh, we really need to kind of really focus on a set of cultural practices for uh, controlling striped cucumber beetle. So I think a few things to know about striped cucumber beetle that is really going to inform the way we think about manage the, manage, managing them using cultural controls. So I, I already said the overwintering location is outside the field. They do probably become active uh, before they invade the, the cucurbit fields. So they're out running around, flying around, feeding on pollen, but they do need cucurbits to complete their life cycle. They will invade fields quickly and sometimes in some years in very high numbers. So one day you could look at your field and not really see any striped cucumber beetles and the next day you could have very high damaging numbers, especially um, a lot, possibly concentrated along the edges. Some cultivars of cucurbits are preferred and we do have some data to show you about that soon. Um, the selection uh, or the preference is actually maybe after they start feeding. It's kind of based on what they're detecting as they feed on the plants. And they also have an aggregation pheromone so that once they start feeding, they can put out the pheromone and that um, attracts both male and female uh, beetles. And then that, that's how they end up swarming sometimes on individual plants or in individual areas of the field as that aggregation pheromone. 
some more information that um, informs the cultural control practices that we think about. Uh, plants are less susceptible to the bacterial wilt pathogen after the five-leaf stage, so that uh, if you transplant, uh, that helps get your plants through that five-leaf stage more quickly, and so your crops are less vulnerable to infection from uh, bacterial wilt. Another aspect is that uh, studies conducted uh, that in Mike Hoffman's lab, in which Jeff, Jeff Gardner works, years ago in Waltham Butternut showed that seedlings um, can tolerate up to 20% damage or defoliation without having yield loss, and transplants uh, before that five-leaf stage can tr tolerate up to 50% damage without yield loss, so that the plants can withstand some damage, um, especially in areas where there's not um, the, the percentage of beetles that are not carrying bacterial wilt is not particularly high. Another uh, thing to know about the beetles is that they are particularly attracted to flowers, so that um, plants that are flowering, uh, they're attracted to yellow color, um, they're going to be uh, uh, the, the beetles are going to be more attracted and you're going to have, have more beetles on plants with flowers than plants that are not flowering. So just keep that in mind in terms of some of the uh, approaches that we're, we'll talk about as we go through this uh, presentation. Now I, I have seen um, some information or some fact sheets suggesting that straw mulch may decrease damage from striped beetle, but this is, uh, these are photos taken last season in a, in a trial that wasn't really a striped cucumber beetle trial, it was more of a weed management trial that included straw mulch as a weed management approach and they found much higher damage from striped cucumber beetle in their mulched plots than in their unmulched plots. So this is just some, uh, to point out, uh, this is just kind of anecdotal uh, situation that we saw that this group saw last season. So we are going to talk about three different uh, cultural approaches for striped cucumber beetle management, uh, non-preferred varieties, row cover, and perimeter trap cropping. So this is uh, the, the type of difference that you can see in the amount of damage uh, when in the same field, in the same cultural practices, uh, uh, with a preferred cultivar, which in this case is golden zucchini on the bottom, and success PM, which is a non-preferred cultivar. And you can see that the success PM plants are much larger, uh, there's no wilting, and they just look very much better. So choice of cultivar uh, can really make a difference uh, in terms of your striped cucumber beetle damage. So one aspect of this cucurbit, OREI funded cucurbit project that, that Jeffrey did was to look at damage on a, a range of different types of uh, cucurbits and different cultivars within those types. This is probably information that people will want to look at more closely in the, the archived recording of this webinar, but just to show you the the, d the data that is available on this um, from this project. You can see for zucchini and summer squash, the cultivar is Romulus, Golden Zucchini, Midlight, Midnight Lightning, Magda, uh, received higher damage than some of the other ones, Cocazel, I'm not even probably pronouncing some of these well, Partanon, Harukan, uh, Golden Bush Scallop, just had just had inherently lower damage because they're not as attractive to the beetles, or they're not a preferred uh, preferred by the beetles for feeding. Same type of information. Oh, I I should go back. I just didn't explain this damage rating. The damage rating goes uh, from one to five, and so that one would be a low level image between 0 and 10 percent and 5 being uh, 90 to 100 percent damage. So you can see the upper level in this particular case was a, a damage rating of 3. 
Moving on to cucumber cultivars, this, in, this, in this case, the uh, damage rating goes up to five, so we're seeing just basically higher levels of damage on the cucumber cultivars. And uh, Diva, National Picking, Pickling Cucumber, and Boston Picker uh, were the cultivars that received the most damage in, in this trial. Uh, compared with uh, Little Leaf and Lemon and Market More uh, toward the bottom. Same type of data for melon cultivars. And Jeffrey, can you can you chime in? Are these uh, PI numbers? Are these uh, cultivars from Michael's program? Or or Lauren, could you chime in on that? I believe they are. Okay. So some of these are commercially available varieties and some are, are part of, of Michael Mazurk's breeding program that Lauren will share some information with you about later. So you can see some of these uh, cultivars out of Michael's program are preferred varieties. Collective Farm Woman is a, wow, what a great name for a melon variety. Um, uh, also highly preferred and then Cultivars like Trifecta, Sweet Gramet, Granite, and PMR Iroquois are much less preferred by the, by the beetles. And again, the scale is going from 0 to 5, and it is that same damage rating that we were using before, and I see that that is cut off on this slide. Sorry about that. Yeah, and I would point out that it's pretty much a continuum. Um, there's no hard and fast rules about which ones to use. It's just that some have a lot less damage than others, so you have to make your own choices ev eventually based on uh, your own plantings and your own observations. Right, and then, and then this, it, this information will also feed in when we talk about um, perimeter trap cropping later. So this is a slide that, that shows uh, different market classes and the relative amount of damage based on market class uh, with zucchini and uh, some straight neck, uh, scallop and crook neck uh, varieties. And this is all summer squash and, and zucchini, right, Jeffrey? No, there's. Um, well, I'll ask Lauren on that. Some of them are actually, uh, I think, immature winter squashes that you can eat. Oh, okay. Like no, the patty pans and stuff like. You be harvested as immature squash and sold as immature. Okay. In this graph here. So these would all be summer in the summer squash category. Correct. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving on to the next cultural practice uh, option that we'll talk about, which is using row cover, uh, either early in the season or possibly throughout the season for some varieties. So row cover, I, th hope, I hope people are familiar with that. It's kind of a spun bond row cover that can be placed directly over the plants or placed over hoops. I have some photos to show you. But putting it, putting it on at early season protects the plants and gets them through that vulnerable growth stage so that they're able to, so that they're less susceptible to bacterial wilt and more tolerant of direct feeding damage from the beetles. Uh, the row cover is really a more suitable, suitable practice for smaller acreages. It's not really a practice that you're going to use on uh, more than, I would say, an acre or so. Uh, you, put, you apply the row cover immediately after transplanting or before seedling emergence. You don't want to row cover beetles right onto your plants. They'll be very happy in there. And often you will need to remove the row cover uh, at flowering for cultivars that need pollination. And when you use row cover, uh, weed management can be a challenge, if, especially if you're using one large piece of row cover. So here's a, whoop, here's a photograph of what we're talking about. I would say this is probably, I don't know, a quarter acre field. And then it's one large piece of one, one large wide piece of row cover, and then it stays in place until the plants start to flower. And this is what they looked like when the row cover came off. So they're pretty large, healthy-looking plants. But you can also see that there's a really uh, 
healthy looking weed population there and so when this row cover comes off there needs to be a plan in place for dealing with these weeds as as well as possible you can you can still get through with a cultivator at that at this point and it would be super important to get in there and do that uh, because I have seen fields like this that don't look so bad at this time of year, but then they've got weeds up to my nose by the end of the season when it comes time to harvest, and that's no fun for anyone. Another approach to using row cover would be to put it over uh, hoops and use pins, and that uh, often works when when you're doing direct uh, when you're doing when you're transplanting into black plastic mulch. So just a uh, Comparison of an attractive and an unattractive variety with and without row cover, uh, two different years. So Success PM was is a, is a variety that's less attractive to beetles, and you can see the the blue line. Um, let me see in 2016. Okay, so in 2016, so in the 2016 trial on top, so we've got number of fruit for plant per plant, and so we're looking at yield uh, with and without row cover. Um, and so you can see under very heavy pressure um, that the, the even success PM without row cover had a relatively low yield. Um, but both the success PM and the golden zucchini under row cover had, had, had decent yield. Um, and, and for 2016, it was probably bacterial wilt rather than direct beetle damage that caused the yield reduction in the success PM, that less attractive variety. Whereas in 2015, you can see that um, both Success PM with no row cover had uh, intermediate yield, not as good as being under row cover, but not as low as the golden zucchini. So that, that reflects the, the difference in the attractiveness of those two varieties to the beetles. And this is just a photo showing um, some of these growth enhancement and yield, possible yield enhancement effects. So you can see on the left, where it says previously covered, these nice healthy looking plants had just had the row cover removed. And compare that with, this is the golden zucchini, which is that attra very attractive variety. There's very small plants and some plants are missing. And then success PM, which didn't have row cover. So you can see that even um, that the row cover enhances growth and yield in both attractive and less attractive varieties, but of course the uh, the impact is larger on the on the more attractive varieties that are going to have greater beetle, po beetle populations. And a different trial um, shows that uh, this was this was all work that was done in my, out of Michael Mazurik's lab. So at the previous that row cover work and and this different cultivar work, um, different cultivars showed a different yield response to row cover treatments. So here we have four different row cover treatments, uh, on in in each of the next few slides, it's going to be the same variety but different row cover treatments. Now the row cover would be that regular white, somewhat opaque uh, spun bond row cover, and then Protect Net is uh, a a more apparent uh, kind of stretchy row cover um, that has allows more light and air to move to move through the uh, underneath the row cover. So here we have Success PM, that relatively uh, not very attractive variety with row cover, with uh, row cover take uh, with the Protect Net taken off at flowering with the protect not net on all season and then no covering. And so the next several slides will have these same four treatments. And I'm the row cover, Lauren, I hope you know something about this. I'm thinking the row cover was taken off, uh, the regular row cover was taken off after at flowering as well. Correct. Yes, that's correct? Okay, good. Yeah. So you can see that the, the higher cumulative um, yield in terms of fruit per plant was highest with the row cover taken off at, at um, flowering. Uh, and the next was the protect net taken off at flowering. And then the protect net on all season. And then, the, of course, the lowest was with no, no covering at all. Um, the, now, who is it? Was it Emily, the person uh, who provided me with this data, said the protect net um, toward the end of the season was kind of pushing out 
uh, of the of the plants were pushing out of the protect net, so that was not per a perfectly good cover as the season progressed. So that probably allowed some pollination and as well as some beetles to come in later in the season. But I think what we're seeing here is that, um, especially for the the all season uh, covering, is that some cultivars are more parthenocarpic, which means they don't need pollination than other cultivars. So a cultivar that doesn't need pollination, we would expect to see higher yield when the row, co when the row cover's on or the protect net's on all season, and we would expect to see lower yield when they're not, when they do need, uh, have a, a greater need for pollination. Okay, so here's another variety called Parthenon, and this one is parthenocarpic. And you can see that even with the row cover or the protect net on all season, uh, the yield was very high compared with the, the relatively low yield uh, without row covering. Golden zucchini, which is that extremely attractive variety, uh, an extremely attractive variety, um, does seem to need uh, pollination, but had very good yields with both row cover and um, protect net removed at flowering, and almost no yield um, with no row covering. Cavili, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, Cavili is um, listed as parthenocarpic, uh, which means it doesn't require pollination, but it doesn't seem to be as parthenocarpic as the partenon was. So you can see that both the row cover and the protect net provided good yield when removed at flowering lower yield when it was on all season, um, and again, quite a bit of real yield reduction with no row cover at all. And then Golden Glory, another uh, variety that seems to be quite attractive, um, and that doesn't, it, that is not listed as parthenocarpic in the seed catalogs, but we have some research data that I've linked to here on the bottom that shows that Golden Glory is, is highly parthenocarpic or does not require pollination. So good yield with all three row cover treatments and very little yield with with no covering. So moving on from uh, uh, the cultural pro approach of uh, planting less attractive varieties, we're going to talk about a, a, a an approach called perimeter trap cropping that was developed under conventional farming con uh, practices. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is possibly adopting perimeter trap cropping to organic crop production practices. And the main obstacle to that is the lack of an effective organic insecticide for perimeter for use in organic systems. So in perimeter trap cropping, the idea is that you surround your main crop, which in this case, this is a research plot, so it's kind of an exaggerated or a, a smaller version of what you'd see in the field. So you would have a main crop, in this case it's melons in the middle, and you would surround it by a more attractive cultivar that would, that would um, focus the beetles on this perimeter trap crop. You're not actually planting this as a crop that you plan on harvesting. You're actually planting it just the, to attract the beetles. And in, in a conventional system, the perimeter trap crop or the more attractive crop would be either sprayed with a foliar insecticide or there are systemic insecticides that are used in conventional production that the perimeter trap crop would be treated with that. And so the idea in, a, in the perimeter trap cropping system for conventional systems would that you would be able to use less insecticide. In an in a, in a organic system, we're really trying to use the perimeter trap crop as, as, a, as more of a control measure. So uh, I would say that perimeter trap cropping would be more attractive, more suitable for larger acreages compared with, um, with a row cover. The trap crop really has to be more attractive than the main, so you really have to have a differential between attractiveness. Uh, Hubbard and Buttercup are often used as a trap crop for 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 um, main crops like uh, butternut squash. 
Having the trap crop flowering earlier will help it uh, be a more attractive perimeter trap crop. Remember we talked about earlier about the beetles being attracted to flowering plants. Um, placing yellow sticky cards or yellow sticky tape in the trap crop may enhance, this, enhance its attractiveness. Uh, applying surround, which is a kale, kale and clay product, to the main crop can de decrease its attractiveness. So that, that would turn this into kind of a more of a push-pull system so that the perimeter trap crop would be very attractive and we'd be making the main crop that we want to harvest less, att less attractive by using the applying the surround um, clay. Um, the, as I said, the, the obstacle for organic systems is that there is not an effective, effective insecticide that we know of right now to kill adults. So we can aggregate, we know we can aggregate the adults on the trap crop, but um, the question is how can we reduce the population once we get them there? So this is just uh, just a photo of what the plants look like uh, treated with surround. So this is what you know your main crop would look like if you were applying surround. And it's something that surround it's you'd have to when the plants are actively growing, you'd probably have to keep reapply it, reapplying it weekly as no as new new foliage came came along. So I just wanted to show we have done some uh, work with insecticides against uh, striped cucumber beetle and in looking at some historical trials and then a trial that Brian Nault did that was funded by IR4 this past season. We tried uh, products Azera, which is a mixture of py pyrethrin and neem or azadractin and trust, which is spinosad an experimental uh, product. I can't remember which company it was. I don't think it was Marone, but um, and then Surround, which seems to be a grower standard in, in the Northeast for, for trying to manage striped cucumber beetle. And you can see uh, that none of these uh, products were effective against, c compared with the untreated control against striped cucumber beetle. And then uh, this is just what I showed you before was beetle numbers, uh, adult numbers on 10 plants. And so a comparison of this is percent defoliation on two different dates for this trial. Again, uh, the same four applications before this. And you can see that the surround does provide, does uh, reduce the percent defoliation compared with the untreated and the, and the insecticide treatment. So just, just to demonstrate that it really is a challenge to control these adult beetles. So the research questions that were explored um, with this project in terms of perimeter crop cropping was um, in terms of trying to manage the beetles on the perimeter trap crops. Will the striped cucumber beetle adults lay more eggs on the trap crop <clears throat> versus the main crop? So can we, can we concentrate that egg laying on the trap crop? And then will destroying that trap crop uh, such that so that the that next generation of adults doesn't emerge, uh, will that reduce adult emergence so that um, we could reduce that population going into the winter and perhaps over time reduce overall striped cucumber beetle populations on a, on a farm. So this trial was conducted in 2014 and 2016. Blue Hubbard was paired with either Golden Zucchini, a very attractive variety, uh, or Success PM, a less attractive variety. Uh, beetle numbers and damage ratings were collected in 2014, but not in 2016. And then once that that initial overwinter, that initial gen, uh, batch of adults had kind of that the numbers had had subsided, and all the beetles were in the ground, or all the larvae were in the ground feeding on the on the roots, the Hubbard plants were either mowed, rototilled, or they were left undisturbed to see if the, those, the mowing or rototilling practices would reduce the adult emergence. And to, to track that adult emergence, two emergence cages were placed over each variety in the plots, and then the adults were counted when they, when they came out. And so just a kind of a schematic of what the experimental design looked like. In 2014 there were three different treatments. Um, so Hubbard was was paired with Success PM, um, which was less attractive, and Hubbard was the attractive variety. And then there were just the three uh, disturbance 
undisturbed, rototilled, or mowed. And, in 20, oh, and so here are the results from 2014, which, which show that, um, so these are uh, adult numbers emerging in those emergence traps. This shows that success PM had lower emergence, and so that uh, lower larval feeding, lower egg laying on the success PM than on the blue hubbard. But these, uh, these mowing and rototilling treatments don't make any sense because what we would expect that would be that either that mowing or rototilling would have lower adult emergence than the blue hubbard that was just left undisturbed. So I can't explain this result. I don't think, Jeff, can you explain this result? Does this make any sense to you? No. So we can't explain that result. <laughs> If that, that, and just so I'm just saying that's not what we would have expected. And so this is um, a different way of looking at the same data for 2014. Beetles per plant on the blue hubbard versus the, the blue hubbard is the black and the success PM um, on different sampling dates. Um, and so that lower adult numbers, adult beetle numbers on the less attractive variety and lower damage ratings on the less attractive variety on the four different sampling dates. On this fourth sampling date, beetle numbers per plant probably reflected the fact that the um, success PM uh, started to flower, so that attracted the beetles, but it, um, but this damage level was still lower on the success PM. On the 26, 2016 trial design, uh, another factor was added in, which was that um, both an attractive variety and an unattractive variety were paired with a blue hubbard. So both the success PM and the golden zucchini were paired with the blue hubbard, just to demonstrate that there needs to be a difference between the attractiveness of the main crop and the and the trap crop. Okay, so in 2016 you can see that here's the blue hubbard, which is a is a kind of a standard perimeter attractive perimeter trap crop crop and golden zucchini had the same kind of level of damage so blue hubbard would not have attracted would not have protected golden zucchini whereas the success pm had lower levels of damage so the 2016 trial results are kind of um, more of what we would have expected in terms of that crop destruction and beetle emergence so you can see that um, the highest number of adults uh, emerged from the golden zucchini, uh, followed by the undisturbed blue hubbard, uh, and then lower uh, beetle emergence from the, the less attractive success PM. And then in 2016, this is as we would have expected in both years, uh, both the mode and uh, blue hubbard and the rototill blue hubbard had lower adult emergence, which means we were able they they were able to destroy the larvae that were feeding on the roots and prevent adult emergence of that other generation. And that the rototill treatment uh, was more effective at controlling those larvae on the roots than the than the mowing. So uh, this is uh, we're gonna I'm gonna turn this over to Lauren next, and so just a few take-home messages from this uh, beetle management part. Uh, in the in the absence because we don't have effective insecticides, we need to think about an integrated long-term strategy to strip cucumber beetle management. Row cover can be very effective for smaller acreages. You need to keep in mind um, the the need for pollination of your cultivar that you're growing. And the differences in cultivar attractiveness can be exploited to, strip, to manage strip cucumber beetle. Uh, you can just plant cultivars that are inherently not as attractive uh, if, they, if, they make, if they fit into your crop and marketing mix. And that perimeter trap cropping and trap crop destruction, taking advantage of that differential between a, a, an attractive, a less attractive main crop and an attractive perimeter trap crop may reduce um, beetle populations over time. So I'm going to turn it over to Lauren now. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So that was, um, you know, we talked a lot about cultural controls and like Abby mentioned, there are also non-preferred varieties, which we have been talking about quite a bit, and we can exploit this non-preference in breeding even more non-preferred varieties. So again, to reiterate what 
has been said, some of the market classes within cucurbit pipo, like summer squashes, acorns, and delicatas, are much less preferred by beetles than some other market classes like zucchini and pumpkins. And we see this both when there are mixed plantings, there are many varieties around, and also when there's only one local variety. So if we plant an isolated quarter acre of summer squash, we will still see that these plants are relatively undamaged, even when these beetles have very little other local food choices. So this has laid the foundation for our breeding program, knowing that uh, summer squashes have this resistance. And of course, you can just grow summer squash, but you might also want to grow zucchini, and we want to make it easier for you to do so as plant breeders. So the way that we are approaching this is to get to my next slide. There, there we go. Okay, so we want the best of both worlds. If we want a zucchini type fruit with a summer squash resistance, what we'll do is we'll cross pollinate them. And this is diagrammed here of a golden zucchini showing its fruit and level of damage on the left side of your screen, and a summer squash showing the fruit and very little damage on the right side. And the idea here is that we cross pollinate these two, and over many generations, which are uh, shown by these arrows, continue to select for plants that are non-preferred but have this zucchini fruit with the idea that, again, you grow a zucchini that takes a little less effort to manage. So to date, we've um, been working on this, and we have made many of these cross-pollinations that I mentioned between many different cultivars, not just this golden zucchini and success PM that we've been talking about. And after making this cross-pollination, we initially screened these plants in the greenhouse. And you can see some pictures of this on the right-hand side of your screen. So on the top, you see a large cage. It's really just PVC pipes with row cover all over it and held together by clothespins. And we'll put, I'll put hundreds and hundreds of little squash plants in there, which are shown below and then select the least damaged ones and advance those a generation. And we choose this method because, uh, as was mentioned earlier, younger plants are the most vulnerable to uh, loss of leaf and also bacterial wilt, so we still want to screen these really young plants. And this saves us a little space on our farm. But of course, we need to see how they perform in the field. So our next step as we are, are advancing these generations is to do field trials this upcoming season with some advanced lines. Um, as you might notice, this isn't a particularly fast process. Uh, so while we're doing this, we're also trying to understand a little bit more about the mechanisms of why beetles prefer some squash over others, and then trying to integrate that into our breeding program so we can select in the off-season. And what that means, hopefully for you, is that we'll have non-preferred cultivars to you much faster. Um, so, and... We're still a couple years away from our ideal finished cultivar with uh, a non-preferred zucchini, but you'll be the first to know once we have seeds for you. And that is all I have for our breeding work that is underway. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Lauren and Abby and Jeff. Um, and we have lots of questions coming in. So a couple really quick questions first. Um, going back to the beginning of the presentation, is the bacteria wilt that you were talking about um, xanthanomus? Oh, goodness. I'm not going to be able to. I'll have to. It is not. Um, it is Erwinia trichophilia. There you go. Thanks, It Laura. is not xanthanomus, but it is another bacteria. Okay, great. Thanks. And then um, we have a question about the um, larva of the cucumber beetle. How big is it? Oh, it varies depending on how old they are, but they're quite small. I'd say a large one's maybe a half inch long, eighth of an inch wide or less than that. Little white things with black heads. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. What about... Um, spotted cucumber beetles. Would this information pertain to them as well? Somewhat. A lot of the diabrotocytes, which are the various uh, uh, beetles that feed on cucurbits, 
um, have similar ecology in that they're pollen feeders and then we'll uh, move over to cucurbits afterwards. What we see in the Northeast is that typically the spotted cucumber beetle is uh, very occasionally a problem. It's mostly the striped cucumber beetle. So, um, but in general, uh, those insects have sort of the same behaviors, same, same sort of life cycles and whatnot. So, uh, I guess I would, I guess I would wonder, Jeff, if they would have the same reaction to the different cultivars. That I do not know. Because they're less specialized, right? Yes. So they, yeah, so they might have a, 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 a less of a response to the cucurbitacins. Yes, we see so few of them in our trials that we stopped taking counts on them. So I don't know that information, but I, you know, it probably is in the literature if you look closely enough. Okay, um, I guess this may be a question for Lauren. Um, we have a question about when the varieties um, may become commercially available that you're breeding and how um, you'll be informing people about that. I know that we at Your Organic host a website for the Eastern Sustainable Cucurbit Project, and I'm going to put the link to that in the chat box. And I know there's some information in there about some other new varieties that are resistant to cucurbit downy mildew, but um, at this point we don't see any um, striped cucumber beetle resistant varieties, but can you talk about that a bit, Lauren? Sure, yeah, they are in progress. We are still quite a few generations out from having a released cultivar, but we will um, promote it through the same channels as, as our mildew cucumbers, um, so through our Eastern Sustainable Cucurbit grants, and we also go to meetings like the Organic Seed Growers um, and other like, North Northeast Organic Farmers Association meetings that we will certainly be promoting and sending seeds to anyone who wants it once it's available, but we're still we're still quite a few seasons away from that. Okay. Well, I did put a link to the website there in case you'd like to find out more about the project and the new varieties that they have released already. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, let's see. Have you seen squash bugs? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you mean squash bugs or the striped cucumber beetles um, crawl underneath the row covers. Uh, both do, in my experience, more so the striped cucumber beetles. Um, they tend to seek refuge when they have an opportunity. I suspect that's why in the straw mulch uh, pictures that Abby showed, there was such heavy damage. They have somewhere to hide and they feed on the area of the stem then that is below the cotyledons. In young plant, plants, that can be quite a problem. In older plants, it scars them up and may stunt them a bit. But uh, yes, indeed, the beetles do get underneath the row cover. They don't seem to spend too much time there, though. Okay. Um, let's see. Are there any natural predators of striped cucumber beetles? Um, for example, parasitic wasps? Uh, there are wasps and flies both that parasitize them. Unfortunately, what happens is they're able to complete their life cycle before the parasite kills them. So we see essentially fairly high levels of parasitism, but not much effect due to it. Yeah, and there are other um, predators as well. It's just ge generalist predators like spiders and and uh, rove beetles and and kind of generalist feeders that might encounter them, um, but not as uh, uh, specific a relationship as the predator or the parasitoids that Jeff was talking about. Okay, we have a couple questions about um, the disposal methods for the trap crops. Um, do you mow them or till them under, and if so, at what point in the season was that done? Well, what you'll notice about striped cucumber beetles is they crash in late July, and then that's before the second generation or that current season's generation comes out. So that's the time um, to destroy them after you no longer need to capture them, capture the beetles. Um, what was the rest of the question? Um, yeah, just the disposal method, um, whether they're mowed or tilled, and um, how, how oh, you dispose of them. You know, there, I think there's a problem with mowing a lot of times, is that you really can't kill the plant when you mow it. So I would suggest if you want to try it, at least mow it and rototill it, or, or at a minimum rototill it, or something like that, disc it up or whatever. Um, 
In other systems, what happens when the plant does not completely die underground is that the organisms that feed on the roots can continue to develop because the roots have not yet died. So um, in the experiments, it was a little bit iffy if there was much effect from one year to another. Uh, so I would suggest tillage if you do anything. Okay. Yeah, Alice, and I'll just I'll just add that um, one kind of future piece of research that I'm that I'm trying to get some funding for is to target the larvae with something like a, a parasitic nematode, some kind of a commercial product hmm. uh, that would rat, so that that would could possibly eliminate that tillage step, which I know is a big is a is a big hassle. Not not what everybody wants to do, but so to, so to try to target those larvae as a more vulnerable life stage to some kind of insecticide or some kind of a treatment than the adults, because we haven't had any luck killing the adults. Okay, yeah, we have some other interesting questions about um, killing um, beetles in the trap crops here. Um, one is, have you tried to vacuum the tra trap crops as a kill step for the adults? Yes, we have. It's a lot of work. Okay. Um, what happens is that, you know, as a male beetle shows up and finds a plant attractive, it sends out a signal and it calls in other beetles. And when it calls in other males, those males also send out the pheromone. So there's a stronger pheromone plume and then you get more beetles. So there's a constant influx of beetles if, unless you keep on top of it. Yeah. And in the vacuuming systems, it will work. It's a bit ponderous, and you have to do it frequently. Um, years ago, there was work done in California on ligus uh, in strawberries, and it was quite effective. But those were some big machines that they were using. You, it can be done. It takes a lot of work. OK. And another question, um, what are your thoughts on burning the trap crops, particularly in the early summer, to get the first generation of overwintering adults? Hmm. That would probably work. You would kill your trap crop. You want to make sure it's there during the duration that you need to protect your main crop, though. So, but it probably. I'm. I'm. I'm thinking if there had been already been egg laying. I'm just wondering if burning would would kill the plants enough that it would kill the roots and then kill any larvae that were that were feeding on the roots. What do you think, Jeff? I don't think it would kill the stuff on the roots. It would kill right. the adults that are on top potentially. Right. Right, yeah. OK. Um, let's see. Here's a question about whether a strict crop rotation with large distance between cucurbits from year to year could work on large farms. My initial inclination is that it wouldn't. These beetles are very strong flyers. They leave the field in the fall and go out into the environment uh, over winter in wood in hedgerows and whatnot, and as soon as a cucurbit is available for them to smell, they will go to it, regardless of whether it's an attractive cucurbit or not. Um, so I'm, I'm not real confident that rotation has a whole lot to do with it. Uh, the work really hasn't been done, but my again, my initial inclination is a rotation pretty, pretty iffy on striped cucumber beetle. Okay, um, let's see. Here's somebody who has striped cucumber beetles in Oregon, and as well as 12 spot beetles, and was wondering if you happen to see any correlation um, between those and the striped cucumber beetles. I guess that's my question. I don't even know what the 12 spot beetle is. Okay. Is it the same as our spotted cucumber beetle? <laughs> um, yeah, and I think there's a different species of striped cucumber beetle in the West, so I don't. Uh, I think the biology. I think the biology is similar, but uh, like I said before, I'm not sure that the reaction or the response to the different cultivars would be the same. I think that I think that work would need to be repeated in an area that was predominantly spotted cucumber beetle or the western striped cucumber beetle. Okay. Um, let's see. Have you um, tried any organic repellents? I have not. I have not. OK. Um, here's a question about whether the beetles feed on the fruit of the cucurbits as well. Yeah, yeah, they will, uh, especially that um, generation that emerges in August. They'll feed on 
it, if, especially if they're high numbers, they they can they can scar summer squash and and uh, and they can cause a damage to the surface of pumpkins that um, for some markets will make them less less marketable. And this year, where we had extreme beetle pressure, uh, probably link, linked to the long, dry, early summer, uh, there was fruit damage due to the overwintering generation oh, from wow. 2015. Hmm. Uh, again, row covers may be effective there. That's the floating row cover, not the plastic mulch row cover. Uh, I should also add that, in the at least in the Northeast and probably in other areas, the western corn rootworm will also invade cucurbit fields. Um, they look similar in that they both have yellow stripes, but the stripes are not as defined on the western corn rootworm. And uh, the abdomen of the western corn rootworm is yellow rather than black. So yes. the late season, um, you need to be careful about what it what is actually causing the damage because both will damage uh, the fruit in similar ways later in the season. Okay, here's a question. Um, it looks like it's for Abby and Jeff here. Um, it looked like the data for row cover versus ProTechNet all season versus off at flowering was for only two weeks. Is that correct? You kept saying all season. It seemed like most that were covered all season still produced at least one fruit per week. Is that right? Uh, that was that was work that was done in Michael's lab, I, right, Jeffrey? Michael did that work. Emily did it. I don't know if Lauren is familiar with it or not. She would be better positioned to answer that question. Yeah, can you repeat the question? I sure. Yeah, it said that the data for whether the data for um, the row cover versus the ProTechNet all season versus off at flowering was only for two weeks um, because it seemed like you were saying all season. It seemed like that most work, most of the ones that were covered all season still produced at least one fruit per week. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So the ones with row cover, the protect knife off at flowering, those are taken off at flowering and we evaluated fruit or fruit count for the same days for each treatment. So uh, we, we harvested and counted fruit between the 18th of July and the, okay, it was the 3rd of August. So it was the same time period, just the ProtectNet and row cover came off in two of the treatments at flowering. Does that clarify? hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, you can always type in if it doesn't here. Um, okay. Um, is there a way to isolate the grouping pheromone to create a trap? Has any work been done like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that one's a tough one. Um, the pheromone that you find commercially really isn't the pheromone. Um, the pheromone itself is a very specific mirror image of another molecule called an enantiomer. Um, very difficult to synthesize and very expensive to synthesize. I think when we wanted a few milligrams for research, it would be in the range of fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. So it's it's quite a complicated procedure. I don't have a lot of hope for it at this point. Uh, the chemistry has worked out. The methods have been developed. I believe it's been patented by Bernite or somebody like that, Bernite Bright or Christoph Schneider in Germany. But uh, I wouldn't hold your breath waiting for it. Well, Jeff, do you want to talk about the other attractant that you worked with before? Allyl, what's it called? What's that? TIC? Yeah. Yes, there is an attractant. I don't know that it's approved for organic culture. It's a combination of three flower volatiles, which is trimethoxybenzene, transcinamaldehyde, and indole. Um, you, I'm guessing it's not approved for organic culture. It is effective. It will attract beetles. Um, for you those conventional growers out there, it may be an option. You you weren't applying it to the to the crop though you were using it as a volatile is that correct? It was a it was a bait to a trap and kill type trap. Okay, so yeah, so without a, an effective insecticide, 
uh, in organic systems, that particular approach wouldn't wouldn't work. Correct. The insecticide we used was, of course, rotenone, which is no longer registered. Mm -hmm. It was effective. Okay. Okay. Um, is any work being done on hormone disruptors, like in apple production? I don't you know. Pheromone, pheromone disruption? I think that may be what she means. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, so I think that relates to the other question about whether the pheromones uh, could be used as a control, cultural practice, as a control measure, but so I think we already have the answer to that is that it would be, it's too expensive and, and not available. Okay, um, do you think you could Correct. use um, ground or juiced plants as an attractant? Mm. Well, the, there is a there is a uh, an attractant uh, uh, it's, which is ground up buffalo gourd, and um, blanking on what it's called is it called uh, side track C I D E T R A K that's uh, a feeding stimulant. Um, yes, it, and it isn't per se an attractant. It is an arrestant, and it causes them to feed. But it will—it's not a volatile, so it doesn't attract them. Okay. Um, I don't believe that grinding up a plant will work on it. Our belief is that the male aggregation pheromone interacts with specific plant volatiles. Basically, when the male decides there's an attractive plant there, it will send out a signal, but that signal, that honest signal, must be accompanied by some plant volatiles that are probably induced by feeding, and they may be metabolically induced as well. We are not sure. That's one of the projects we're working on. Um, so I don't think grinding a plant would necessarily work. You can try it. <laughs> Okay, we have a comment from a researcher in Oregon who has done work with 12-spot beetles, and so after the webinar, I will put those two people in touch with each other. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay, do you know what smell the cucurbits give off that attract the beetle to be able to make a trap? I guess that's a similar type of question about the juices there. Yes, we don't know yet what what the aromas are. Again, our belief is that in general there are just generic cucurbit volatiles that will initially attract the beetles out of the surrounding environments. Then, subsequent to finding an appropriate host, they need to make a choice as to which are the most preferred. Uh, the the compounds was that are responsible for that are probably somewhat limited in number. Um, we're getting closer to it, and within two to three years, we may have an answer. And at that point, the plant breeders can start to select or for or against those specific volatiles. Okay. Um, let's see. This person has noticed that late-season uh, striped cucumber beetles tend to swarm and feed on the odd butternut squashes left behind in a field post-harvest. Could leaving a few squash behind and subsequently destroying these squash be a potentially useful technique for population control? My sense is that would be unlikely. Um, when we worked with pumpkins in the fall, the number that you find feeding on the fruit itself is relatively small to the number that would have been produced that year. So I suspect you wouldn't get too much control. Uh, again, these beetles are strong flyers. They come in from we don't know where, but they're capable of it. Well, I, I guess I'm thinking maybe on a smaller acreage, if that if that was the case and the temperatures were low, it would be a good vacuuming opportunity to get out there and they'd be all concentrated. They wouldn't be very flighty and you might be able to suck a lot of them up. But as Jeff said, how many are actually, probably it looks like there's a lot, but how many are actually there compared with the ones that have already left um, is, is questionable. Okay, I know, Abby, you mentioned you're going to be working with nematodes, hopefully, um, but here's a question about whether the parasitic nematodes to target larvae are specific for SCB or can generally commercially available um, nematodes possibly be effective? Uh, the data that I have seen so far have used nematodes that are generally commercially available and 
there hasn't been consensus between the different trials about one of them being de definitively more effective than than another. And I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head which species have been tried. Um, but I know like Steiner Nema carpocapsi has definitely been tried and found effective in, a, in at least one trial. Um, Felti, uh, I think, is another one that comes to mind, but uh, incomplete information, sorry. OK, um, let's see. These people have found that um, the beetles will aggregate on damaged plants, for example, those that have been damaged by storms. Have you noticed the same thing? Uh, that I have not noticed. What I have noticed, and this is anecdotal, we were unable to quantify it, uh, is that stressed plants seem to be attractive. Uh, what we see is that some varieties that we would otherwise consider fairly tolerant or resistant, not preferred, when they come out of the greenhouse and are a bit pale yellow, yellow and then transplanted and are a bit water stressed, the beetles seem to really like them regardless of cultivar. So it wouldn't surprise me that some kind of hail damage or something might render a plant more attractive. Okay, is there anywhere a um, model of growing de degree days when the beetles start to emerge? Is, is that information available anywhere? I'm unaware of it. Okay. I'm not aware of any either. I guess I'm wondering if the question is about the overwintering winter beetles or the beetles that emerge uh, in, in July. Uh, it might be possible to I, I'm not aware of a model, but it might be possible to be able to predict forecast when that, that would happen based on, on soil temperature and, and heat accumulation. Okay, if anyone knows about that, feel free to comment here. Um, what about birds? A, um, our garden is full of birds that eat the bean beetles um, that have here in the interior of Alaska. So do you have any <laughs> comments about birds? Well, I, I can. I have some... A couple of anecdotal reports from uh, local growers who, after they started planting sunflowers on their farm, they they believe that uh, the some the the beetles that emerge in August, that late later season beetles, are on the sunflowers feeding on the pollen, and that birds are feeding on the beetles there. Um, one grower reports that his overall beetle population has been uh, is reduced and is much less of a problem since he started to do that. So, but, I, but that is anecdotal. And, and please be aware that um, the compound that the beetles like from cucurbits, uh, one of the compounds is cucurbitacins, a group of compounds called cucurbitacins. They are quite bitter and quite toxic. So it may well be be that the birds may feed on them, but they probably don't do it more than once or twice unless they're specially <laughs> adapted to it. Hmm. And if you've ever swallowed a beetle, you'll know what I'm talking about. They are just Have you not ever swallowed a beetle? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. One of the hazards of the occupation, huh? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Um, oh, yeah. Going back to damaged plants or stress plants, do, do damaged plants exude some sort of attractant, do you think? damaged by the beetles, they okay. most likely do. The attractant would be a volatile, however, and it probably interacts with male-produced aggregation pheromone. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, how deep in the roots are the larvae feeding? Is it just on the surface? No. Um, some research done in 2008 with aluminized plastic mulch show that uh, it controlled, helped to control larvae in the first five centimeters or so, which is, what, two inches, but below that it had little effect, so I'm assuming based on that and based on our soil sampling that they get considerably deeper than that. And if they're typical of most root feeding organisms that are not attached to the root, they will move uh, to where the feeding is best within the root zone. Okay. Um, what about a foliar application of sidetrack plus spinosad, um, a feeding stimulant and a stomach toxin? Do you think that might work? Uh, 
that that's a good idea, and I'm trying to think if I've seen anyone who has tried that. Uh, that would that would that could possibly increase the amount of the insecticide that the beetle uh, ingests. But if the insecticide is not very effective in the first place, I don't know if it would make that much of a difference. But it is that is a good a good idea. And and be somewhat aware of how the ecology of these bitter compounds interacts with the with the cucumber beetle. Once they feed on these bitter compounds, they're less attracted to these bitter compounds. And what will actually happen is they may feed more voraciously on a plant that lacks these <laughs> Uh, alleged feeding stimulants. Uh, a woman in our laboratory did that work mm, back in late 90s or something, and it's published. If if you need information on it, just email us, and we'll send you the literature. Okay. Um, is it correct that transplanted zucchini are more resistant to the beetles than direct seeded plants? I would say yes. Yeah. A larger plant in general is is more tolerant of the beetles. Well, more tolerant of damage, yeah. Yes, yes. When you have a very young plant, such as a, a seedling emerging, if the beetles feed beneath the cotyledons, which are the, the, the first leaves that come out on the plant before the true leaves emerge, the leaves that emerge from the seed itself, if they feed below that, it will often kill the plant. That's where the real damage to seedlings can occur, although they will pretty much munch the whole plant given the opportunity. Okay, I think we have time for one final question here. Um, we've always removed the row covers 10 days after the start of flowering on cucurbit. We do end up with some poorly pollinated fruit initially, but it limits the striped cucumber beetle damage. Is this recommended? Yes, I think that's a that's a... A, a good practice that uh, if for, if it if it fits in with the scale of, of production, yes, it gets the beetles past that or gets the plants past that uh, vulnerable stage to bacterial wilt and and gives them more surface area. Uh, they're more they're more tolerant of direct damage from the beetles as well. So yeah, I would say that that's a good a good practice. I, th I think what you will also find, though, is once the flowers emerge, you will find the beetles in the flowers. And um, flower feeding has been shown to transmit bacterial wilt, but again, the plants are a little bit older, so it wouldn't be as bad as if it was foliar, foliar feeding on a younger plant. Um, but again, I don't, I don't think that flower feeding is going to typically cause too much yield loss. Usually in the non the carpet ones, there's such a preponderance of male flowers that you have more than enough to go around anyway. And they do like the pollen in the male flowers, although they do feed in the female uh, flowers as well. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everyone for submitting all these great questions. And thanks to you, Abby, Jeff, and uh, Lauren for presenting your research today. We definitely look forward to future information from this project. And um, once again, thanks to everyone for joining us.